So that's what this collection is. It's just a collection of pictures and photos over the years. So, uh, and there's stories with them. I'm sure you have your own stories, but you know, I am grateful to this class and this school, and especially with a little change happening here in the last next couple of days. You know, I think this is a great tribute to uh, the town, the community, this class. So it's, uh, uh, you know, again, thanks for coming. Regarding the heat, I thought since they didn't have heat in 55 and 56, it would be appropriate that we would not have heat here either. <laughs> anyway, the outside's air conditioned, but it isn't here. But that gives us a little feel for the, to put us in the era of the 50s. So. Also, as part of today, I'm not sure the exact number of people that graduated from this school. A small school, a small class is obviously they have a small total. So I think a lot of, we've experienced a lot of graduations here. However, I think, I just had the thought the other day, today we're here to kind of graduate the school. For years, this school did, you know, harbor, nurture, you know, provide stability, provide education, provide direction, you know, in ways we may not have thought about. So, you know, with the change in effect, I think it's also a time to celebrate, you know, a time to, you know, to graduate this building, this facility, and to, you know, feel proud of yourselves for the time and the experiences and the people associated with it. So that's another kind of reason for this celebration. The chairs are empty, but the photo is clear. And, uh, you know, last year I was trying to think of what's the reason to do this celebration again this year. And uh, besides just the experiences last year, it was realizing that it was just 80 years ago that this uh, team brought some pride to the community. So they're not here, but there's, a, well, I'd like our members of, any members of that players of that group, if they have some sh stories to share or something about their kin. So, welcome to come forward. Uh, a few tales here, I think. I, of course, it, we, uh, we grew up playing baseball in, uh, all over Nebraska. Uh, my, my father moved from here, I think, down to, he moved to Carroll, he moved to Fall City. Humboldt area, we moved out west to Alliance and a place in, in between, so we ended up playing baseball every place we went, and so uh, that's a good thing. Unfortunately, I'm still playing. I, play in a, I live in Lincoln, I play in a softball league in Omaha, so I haven't gotten much smarter, but I've got older. So, uh, my father, uh, when we moved to Creek started a, I, I guess, a little late, I remember, and at the time, uh, there was much money to go around, and so he established those money to pay all the bills, essentially. Uh, he bought the uniforms and provided transportation uh, for his kids, and eventually they made this uh, baseball park in Creed after him. And so I guess one of the most memorable things about you know, him down there is a lot of times his leagues play as a league in, in um, Crete, where I grew up in high school, you think in Helen, Portland, Trey Martell, all the towns around this league. So we're too far apart, maybe 10 or 15 miles apart. And so no transportation. And so my father provided transportation usually for the kids, and it was usually sometimes it was, it was in one car and his. So he had his little car. And he had to probably put about three kids in, in, in the trunk, four or five kids in the back seat, and, and three or four kids in the front seat. And so off we go across these kind of roads and off the ball games. So that's, that's one of the most memorable um, uh, things I think about my father and so forth. But, um, I, I, my father told me this baseball joke, and that's, I guess I'll, I'll close with that. Years ago, it's kind of came around again. So it, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's really good for this occasion. So I, I took a couple of names off of the box scores back here, and so I need the catcher, and I, I need the pitcher. And so the catcher, of course, is going to be my dad, Howard, and uh, the catcher's going to be 
Now, the picture's going to be Vic. I think it was Vic Pulaski. I saw his name in a lot of my schools. So, Vic and Howard were, they're sitting in the, in the stands watching this, this baseball game, and they're getting older and quite over the years. And so, Howard says to Vic, he says, You know, if there's no baseball in heaven, you know, I'm not sure if I want to go there. So, they both think about this, and they're saying, Boy, that's true. So, they, they shake hands. They said, let's make a deal. Whoever dies first comes back and tells the other one that there's baseball in heaven or not. So he said, well, that sounds good. And so a couple weeks later, lo and behold, Vic dies. And so here's how I sit with the by himself. And uh, what's this baseball game? And he, he, he feels this cool breeze go by. And somebody says, oh, oh. So Howard looks around, there's nobody there. And Vic, Vic says, Howard, oh, it's me, Vic. And Howard said, of course. Vic, is that really you? Yeah, I came back to tell you about baseball in heaven. It's great. You're going to love it there. And so but Vic says, well, I got some good news. I got some bad news. I got not bad news, but so-so news. And so Vic says, well, what do you want to hear first? I want to hear the bad news or so-so news. And Howard says, well, Vic said, well, it'll give me the because what could be what could be so bad about you know, dying for the and having to play the baseball. So Vic says, well, I'll give you the good news first. He said, well, of course it's baseball in heaven. You play every day if you want to. You've got the greatest game, you've got the nicest uniforms, and you're giving the love it there. And so Vic says, well, of course you want to hear the you want to hear the so-so news now? And I said, yeah, give me the so-so news. And Vic says, well, I checked a little bit before I came down. He said, you're catching the ball. that's got Glenn any memories of Pop that's the other thing about doing these events is that obviously they're not here and it was so much a part of their life that the kids were just kids at that point too so there's kind of a generation gap in stories so that does present a challenge so it's sometimes just uh, hearsay and um, Last year at the program, I received a phone call that day from a lady and she was excited to hear about the event and her name was Margaret Bettinger. And she was excited to hear that someone was interested in town team baseball and her dad's team. Well, it's Dan Hayes. And it turns out that he's obviously one guy I thought I'd never find out anything about. Anyway, this is what she wrote about Dan. Dan Hayes started playing baseball as a teenager. He took time out for service in World War I and resumed his favorite sport for the rest of his life. The family joke was he played baseball till Nebraska had home games to get to, he had to, he played baseball until he, oh, hit a home run to get to first base. That's how he got. He uh, played in Farwell in St. Paul when playing in St. Paul, Nebraska, and. He played with Grover Cleveland, and they were invited to come to Chicago to try out for their uh, positions. Dan's mother would not let him go, saying he was too young and that there was no life for a baseball player as a farm boy. He con continued to play ball until he was in his late 40s. He hardly ever missed a Sunday on the ball field, and he was always, it was always early mass he would get to, so he'd be off to a good start and never be late. 
One thing that disappointed him was knowing that uh, his sons did not show an interest, that his same interest. He died at an early age of 59 of a sudden heart attack. When he left the Farwell area, he moved to Polk County. He coached teams in Osceola, Stromsburg, Clarks, and Central City, and uh, giving attention to the young men of his teams. He was truly a legend in the Polk and Mary County baseball diamonds. So that's Dan Hayes. Regarding Albert Horky, regarding stories, everyone remembers Albert Horky. So just family members, you know, and it was almost a three generation deal between Albert and Jim and Mike, and today is Mike's birthday also, the other reason for gathering us here. So the Horky's really been a legend for the baseball here. The rest of the players, Al Strelecki was a creamer man on Main Street. I'm sure you have memories of him. And again, in doing the pictures, it's like, didn't know they had a life outside of work, that this was their growing up life. And uh, my grandfather was part of this, and that's, you know, I could, had the privilege of working with him. And, you know, just a couple of things that more recently have come to light is, you know, going through some things uh, regarding Jerry's comments about the service, my grandfather was an undertaker for 25 years. So I've often wondered his connection and his love of the community and people. His last burial was to uh, Private Raymond Zaleski, who was on the 1939 team. And, uh, but I looked at it, it was an average of about one per month you know, he would have buried a friend, neighbor, relative, or a teammate or something. So it was a, uh, you know, quite an insight to him in his life. Plus, he was um, in different business ventures, and uh, he would work with the farmers, and it, you know, one recollection that came back from his son Melvin is that the f one particular storm, the family came to town, and um, they had just been wiped out by the hail and they were in tears because of the situation. Well, at that time, it was uh, Charlie and his two sons, Paul and Eddie, and the farmers, you know, just all got together and hugged, and they all cried. And, uh, you know, Grandpa just says, pay for it as you can. So, you know, it was um, a memorable memory. And, uh, well, Chick Peterson, Played for years with uh, you know, some minor league teams, and uh, his actually the long stretch across the stage is Chick Peterson's catalog or a scrapbook. So that's a 1910 collection of his. Well, to the team of 1926, we, we thank them for the memories and the, the lives they've lived. So. Next is Baseball in Heaven. And uh, Russ, will you come up anyway? Yeah, come on up. It's, uh, Russ's part of the program was actually to relate Baseball in Heaven, which Lou did. <laughs> That was planned for the program. So uh, that part of, is gone, but I'm gonna have Russ just share a few words on something. So it's, uh, it's all yours, Russ. All right. This, this is fine. Uh, I wanna thank Randy here, just to come up here and see all the memorabilia with, with the, the baseball and everything. Baseball's been a part of my family, the Jensen family, for over 100 years. And, but we're kind of the competitor. We're, I'm from Bolas. Uh, my, my grandfather, Pete Jensen, he, he was one of the pioneers with Dilla that started the Sherman Howard League. Um, that's clear back in the early 1900s. My dad, he started playing baseball at the age of 12. He was born in 1908, so that was about 1920 he started, and I think he finally quit in about 1955. He, he could have played pro ball. He was offered a contract, but it was the year he got married and he didn't want to leave. Uh, my brother, too, Kenny, was offered a contract. Uh, he went to tryouts with uh, Bob Gibson, and uh, Bob was signed, and Kenny was signed, too, but he broke his hip in uh, spring training that year and stuff, and uh, that kind of ended his baseball, though. But uh, 
baseball has been a part of my life all my life and everything. And naturally, we, when we come up here, I was supposed to do the uh, if there's baseball in heaven, but Bolas got beat again by Farwell. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, no, it's just a pleasure to come up here and look at all everything Randy's got here and everything. So and it's it's really been nice though. So as thanks, well. Russ. Before we proceed, I would just like all the any family members of uh, just to back up a little bit regarding the 26 team. I know there's quite a horky gathering here today. Would you all please stand and be recognized? And I know regarding the Lucas Savage family, there's probably a few new descendants of Paul here. You please stand. Johorics, the Johori representative. We're going to kind of move along in uh, years, probably about 20 years, 20, no, 30 years, the 1950s. And uh, some of you may know or heard of Jay Brady, but he's a, quite a rememberer. And Jay's not here, but I'd like to present to you a, a good friend of mine, Bob Ingalls, uh, the mayor from Auburn, who's going to share the piece that uh, Jay wrote. And it's pretty explanatory. I think it'll kind of set you back a few years, put you in the mood. Thanks, Lou. I noticed Luke wore out all the everybody's applause before I came on board right here. That's okay, because I'm just kind of a, a little bit of an asterisk on this program today. Um, I'd like to ask if there's anybody here that lives in Omaha? Anybody here that lives in Omaha? Anybody here that lives in Lincoln? A few Lincolnites? And here's the real critical question. Is there anybody here from Worms? Are you really? Kind of? Where at? Somebody else too? Oh, I was sitting right next to these people. I'd like to visit with you folks when we're done with the program. And I'll, and I'll kind of explain that in a little bit and just when I get done with my piece right here. Luke's sitting over here saying, oh my God, what's Ingalls doing to me right now? Relax, this will go okay, buddy. I'm not Jay Brady. I'm not an author. Um, my greatest claim to fame is I'm a friend of Randy Lucas Savage's. And, uh, that's, that's about all I can really say about my life, other than the fact that Jay Brady is also a friend of mine. And Jay lives in Colorado. He's retired with his wife, Nancy. Um, he's from Ainsworth. And if you've ever seen anybody that's uh, uh, dyed in the wool, a uh, small town guy and a real believer in Nebraska is Jay Brady. I think Randy has and his daughters and son have a book over here. Maybe you've got some more of these. If you ever have a chance to get a hold of his book and read it, it's real interesting. And what I have to share with you today is a little excerpt out of one of Jay Brady's books, and it deals with, kind of touches on you guys over here as members of that state basketball tournament team. And Jay talks a little bit about how things used to be. So let me share that with you. Before we enter the old Nebraska Coliseum for state tournament action, a few clarifications are in order. 50 years ago, folks weren't as mobile as they are today. For many youngsters living out state, a trip to Lincoln was the first time they had tasted life in the big city. How many of you guys had been to Omaha and Lincoln, you know, when you were in high school? I know I was in the mid-60s and I didn't get there very often. There were very few motels, so all accommodations required being among the first to receive a room at either the Cornhusker, the Capitol, the Lincoln, or the old Sam Lawrence hotels. The Sam Lawrence was not considered among the very best for either comfort or security, so many kids looking for a high time, it was perfect for their needs. Back then, many teens faced the problem of having either their parents or a chaperone, which curtailed some activities, but certainly not all of it. 
Trying to get any sleep during the tournament was almost impossible. Youngsters running up and down the halls and in and out of various rooms was a ritual every night. Finding a room meant checking on who had a reservation, then sneaking our gear into the room when no one was looking. It was not unusual to end up sharing a room with about 10 or 12 schoolmates. Dropping water-filled balloons from five and six stories up was also a wonderful experience for those of us who had never seen a building which consisted more than one flight up and a basement below. First-time visitors to Lincoln also had to work into their schedule a visit to the state capitol where they could ride an elevator to the top and view the sites below. Except for the few who had ridden in an airplane, this was the highest elevation we had ever encountered. Another must was shopping at Gold's department store in downtown Lincoln. Here we rode an escalator for the first time and saw more merchandise on one floor than our hometowns had to offer all up and down Main Street. Kids wearing school jackets from towns we'd never heard of crowded O Street. Much of the knowledge we gained about Nebraska geography came not from a textbook, but from meeting folks from all over the state during the tournament. And now for the tournament action. And I think maybe you guys will remember some of this stuff. Please remember this was before Pershing Auditorium or the Devaney Sports Center. All games were played on the floor of the University Coliseum. Coliseum, located just north of Memorial Stadium. Classes A and D played their games at the same time, followed by classes B and C. Do you guys remember that? Does that ring a bell? Is that kind of following with what you guys remember? Because I don't remember that, but I, I'll bet you guys do. Of course, you guys were athletes and basketball players. Maybe that's why you'd remember it and I wouldn't. The top two classes played on the main court, which had glass bank boards and was bigger than any floor we ever imagined. Class C and D schools met on the second court, which ran horizontal to the main one. A huge curtain hung from ceiling to floor, dividing the courts, and unless a fan got a seat at the very top of the rafters above the curtain, it was not possible to see the action on both courts. The first round games were played at noon and at 3 p.m. on Thursday afternoon, followed by the evening battles at 7 and 9 p.m. Teams were paired according to their season's records. When the first game in each session was over, Fans from those sections filed out to make room for patrons following the teams who were next to play. Seating capacity was about 12,000, and of course many folks wanted to see all the games. So it was a madhouse to get seated in your home if your hometown didn't play the first game in each session. After Thursday's games, the seating situation much improved because half of the 32 teams entered had been beaten and their followers headed home. Semi-final semi action was held Friday on the same courts, then all four championship games on Saturday were played on the main floor. What time did you guys play on Saturday? Do you remember? Noon. Noon? Was there a game before you? So there was just one game going on on that Saturday, and you guys were on the main floor? You remember the game pretty well? I'll bet you do. I'll bet you remember every bit of it. Isn't this great, Luke? This is cool. For teams from smaller towns, that court looked like a football, looked more like a football field than a basketball court. There was no press box available, so radio announcers held their equipment on their laps surrounded by screaming fans who often disconnected the circuit when jumping to their feet in enthusiasm. I kind of remember that. Kind of the original laptops, weren't they, Luke? Needless to say, it was a zoo, and that's what makes memorable moments. Starting in 1955, there were six classes instead of four. The same format was used since the number of teams on hand was still only 32. Remember, only four teams instead of eight qualified in each class during the few years before the old schedule was returned. Saturday's championship game started at 10 a.m. with the lowest class, and then the finals ran continuously until the Class AA game was played at 9 that evening. It was not nearly as difficult to find a seat for all the final action after the field of contestants had been cut 12 teams, had been cut to 12 teams that final day. Yes, it was a once in event for some, but once in a lifetime experience for many. We saw the sights in the big city. We visited stores we had only seen in movies. We witnessed the world atop the state capitol. And if our team was good enough to qualify for state, we shared at least one game in an atmosphere that heretofore was only played in our wildest dreams. We met people from towns we'd never heard of and we got out our maps to see where they were located. 
Players who had the opportunity to play a game on the main court never forgot how disoriented they were trying to cope with the larger floor and the glass backboards which hung out over the court. It took most of the game to get any sort of bearing after playing in the Cracker Box gyms, which, is the case, which was the case most of the smaller schools experienced. Did you guys play here on this court here? This had to be considered a pretty nice gym. This had to be one of them, because I know from back in the 50s in, in my part of the state, this would have been considered extremely nice. I sometimes editorialize on this, I shouldn't. Um, whenever we were, whatever was a player or a fan, it was for most of us, one of the most memorable times of our high school days. It was recalled in later years at school reunions and it marked the time in our lives when we learned there is much more to our state than we had ever experienced before. It was indeed March Madness and became the main topic of conversation whenever teammates and fans got together to ask each other, do you remember? So that's the end of Jay Brady's little, I think this was one of his chapters in his book, wasn't it? And now, if I could have about 30 more seconds, I just want to do a little personal editorial for small towns here, if that's all right. Um, Randy and I roomed together at Creighton University for a year or two back in the late 60s. Uh, Randy was majoring in business administration, I was majoring in beer drinking, and uh, I was ranked near the top of my class each of my years there. Um, Luke and I, for some reason, after I left Creighton, kind of lost track of each other for 25, 30 years. And then in my little office in Auburn, Nebraska, in walked Randy Lucas Savage. He was going through town, just happened to see my name on the front window, and popped in. And we made a commitment to each other at that time that we were going to stay in contact and we were going to stay connected with, with each other and not let that, that uh, gap occur again. And in getting reacquainted with each other, we had found out during this interim time period of about 25 or 30 years, we really developed a, a common love, and that was a love for small towns. And small towns have a lot of value, people. And why I asked if anybody here lived in Omaha or Lincoln, I don't mean to offend Omaha or Lincoln a lot. But I would rather say I was from Worms than I would from Omaha or Lincoln, because I think there's more character in Worms than there is in Omaha or Lincoln, and nothing against Omaha or Lincoln. My daughter and son-in-law and granddaughter live in West Omaha, and they drive downtown every day to go to work, and that's apparently a lifestyle they like, and, 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 and that, I'm fine with that. But I want to tell you something. These small towns have value, too, and whether you live in Grand Island or St. Paul or Auburn or Farwell or Bolas or wherever in the heck you might be from, or Worms, work at maintaining what we have in these small towns. They have a tremendous amount of value. And uh, I don't want my granddaughters, granddaughters, to be in a room full of people someday in this state. And when they, they say, where are you from? And everybody on one side stands up and says, I'm from Omaha. And everybody on the other side stands up and says, I'm from Lincoln. And there aren't any other people in the room. I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen. I want, I want Farwell and Worms and Bolas and Auburn and St. Paul to all be around for my granddaughter's granddaughter. So I'm glad you're here today. I know that I'm proud of you guys and never even heard of you before today, except for Harold Anderson's column in the World Herald last Sunday. Did anybody see that? That was pretty cool. Harold Anderson writes a column in the World Herald on Sundays and Thursdays, and, and he highlighted this event we're at here today, and that's no small feat, take my word for it. So. Luke, I appreciate everything you've done for uh, keeping Farwell alive and, and recognizing these, this fine basketball team. And I feel very fortunate to be a small part.